Good. Very good. Okay, maybe let's pay homage to the Buddha first. Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambu Dasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambu Dasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambu Dasa Good. Many smiles. Bohut Smitahasya. Very good. It's going to be a smiley department tomorrow. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I thought this was a beautiful chant of the Ratana Sutta. Where did you learn this? Where, where is this? Uh, I mean, not the Ratana Sutta, but the chant is beautiful. I, I gave the music. Oh, <laughs> you, you made the music, uh, arrangements. Very well done. Very beautiful. Good. You trained them well. Yes. <laughs> Could feel the love pouring. It was very nice. Yes. Yes, well, yes, yes. Yes, 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 very good. So, tonight, last talk, last Dhamma Desana. A little bit about what is to come now. Coming back home, bringing the practice home. And, and now you'll notice that your mind is not as calm most of the time. This is, huh? And when we the chat chatting starts, then the mind starts also chatting in the mind. This chatting is only it's only after a lot of things happen in the mind that we start to chat. Then then when there, there's no chatting <laughs> then there's a lot less activity in the mind. But that's okay. Huh? This is a retreat. That's why we come here and we do this because it gives us the supporting causes and conditions so that we can go deeper. We can see deep, deep in the path. And we can actually, it's like digging a well. You dig a well, you dig a well, you dig the earth. And then the more you dig, the more water comes up. And then you can use it when you go back home. You have a source you can come tap into. So that's very useful. And one of the things you'll notice is that, well, now you have to deal with your families, uh, all the distractions, Netflix, and, <laughs> and um, the noisy, or wherever, whatever happens, wherever you live, uh, neighbors, uh, work. But that's okay. Our practice is not just a sitting practice. Uh, we go deeper when we sit, but the true nature of our practice is bhavana, uh, cultivating the mind, wholesome mental development. Uh, there is a story which I really like. Uh, it's called The Man Who Planted Trees. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this story. Uh, it's actually from a French writer, uh, but the story was published in English first. And th it's the story of this old man called Elzea Bouvier, and he was uh, in the French Alps in the mountains. And he was living in a very deserted place uh, where um, there was no trees and there was no, everything was very dry and nothing grew really because the sun was just too much and nothing could grow. And the story, I mean, it's a long story, but I, uh, if <laughs> I go to the core of it, um, this, this man was just living alone in this uh, pretty much a, des a desert. 
and he would only gather seeds of trees that uh, he found and he would sort them out and pick out the good ones, the healthy ones and then he would go out with his sheep every day and he would simply just plant trees plant these little seeds. He would find these little nooks and crevices where it would be a little more shady and a little bit more um, wet or moisture, a little bit of moisture. And he would find these places everywhere and he would just like put a little hole and put a seed and then move away and continue. And after many, many years, uh, he was not... He, he was, he was not really expecting anything. He was not really wanting anything out of this. Just, just the sheer goodness of doing it. And after so many years, uh, he had reforested an, a massive extent of uh, mountain and desert, basically, and made a new, basically planted a forest but this didn't happen in the blink of an eye. Trees take a long time to grow, especially in the desert. And sometimes they're, they're just not gonna survive. You're gonna plant them and then they're gonna grow and then die. And he would come back and fill in what needed to be filled in. But he just took, he just took his time and he was happy doing this. He was not, you know, he was not wanting a forest tomorrow. <laughs> he was just planting now and he was just happy doing that because he knew that he was little by little planting some seeds that would become trees perhaps. Uh, he was there, I, I don't know the name of the person. Uh, it's a French name, Elzear Bouvier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so he was and so I think it's a really beautiful parallel to our lives and our practice and how we perhaps should develop our perspective, how to see our practice in daily life. And to, to remember that this is, this is a slow process. The Buddha said in the, one of the suttas, he says, you know, it's like a carpenter or a fine wood worker who's like working with his chisels all day and he, he's sculpting wood and he's making the mortises and all of this and the, the woodworker doesn't look at his tools every day and sees like mm, this much has been worn out, worn out from my handle like today uh, or this much is remaining on my handle today or like every hour he's not doing that but after a few years then the, he looks at his chisels and says, oh, a lot has been worn out. So this is the same thing with the mind. You can see a lot of these unwholesome states really wear out over the course of time. So it's not, it's not after a few days that we just look at the mind and think like, oh, you know, it's getting pretty good or, you know. So it's normal, like here we're on retreat and we go deep and that's that's the purpose of it and so we can actually have a lot of more wisdom to bring into our lives but then when we come back it won't be the same you know it's not as sustaining as here this is like a very lush forest of dhamma you know you have all the causes and conditions you don't have any disturbances you can just meditate eat walk meditate sleep walk meditate <laughs> So that, this is really good. But when you go home, it's like, okay, now you have a bag of seeds and a stick and you have some knowledge. <laughs> and you can start planting your own forest. And this is true for each of you. Each of you live in different families, different circles, different environments. And you're gonna come home with your bag of seeds and your water and find the little places where you can plant those seeds in your life with your family, with your friends, uh, these little seeds of kindness, of wholesome states, of generosity, 
or just even just listening to somebody because now you can, because now you're calm, you're happy, your mind is happy, so you can actually listen to others. And so, coming home, this is a good way to look at it, a good way to see, well, little by little, and finding joy in planting these little, I like to call these uh, random acts of kindness. It's when, you know, people least expect it or uh, a wonderful opportunity. And you'll start to see everything in your life as just an opportunity to do good, an opportunity to plant seeds of goodness, an opportunity to help somebody. And you'll notice that when you do that, you feel really good also inside for yourself. Then you will notice that Hulu 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 All these little seeds they will start germinating and they'll start growing. And if you take pleasure in just planting seeds, even though it's a desert, you know, it's, it's harsh. It's not, it's not easy for, your, for you to maintain your practice in such conditions. It might take a little bit of time, but if you use everything that you've gained here and you start planting seeds in your life, the seeds of Dhamma, then you will see that if you're just happy doing that for a little bit and you find a lot of joy in this, these little acts, you will find that soon enough it will start to grow. And it will start to grow into little plants. And the little plants, they create shade and they protect the soil and they keep the moisture. And then little animals starts coming. And then you have life that starts happening in this little underbrush. And then it starts to grow a little bit more. And as you bring this home, as you keep planting, you'll see it will start to protect you in return. And so this is how the Dhamma works. When we give the Dhamma, we also get the Dhamma. So that's the beauty of dana. It's not just dana, oh, you should give, you know, just because you should give or because it's good to give. It is, but it's also exponentially uh, helping. Uh, I don't know in the mathematics how you would say. <laughs> it's more than exponential. It's like... Multiplying. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And the more you do it, the more it comes back to you. That's the beauty. That's why the Buddha said, if people knew just the way that I do, how beneficial giving is, they would never eat a meal, even a single meal, without sharing it with somebody else. Or even take something without sharing it with somebody else. Even if it was their last bite of something. Because uh, he said, because of generosity, we're not stingy, we're giving. And it works in both ways. Both were, were, we don't need so much. We just, okay, okay, I can give that. Okay, I can give it to you. And we're making somebody else happy. So we're keeping ourselves in a really good place. <laughs> and this generosity in one way or another, or another, it always comes back to you more than a thousandfold and that is also in the suttas so when you give it comes back to you not just once more it's like a thousandfold more dana sila bhavana and so i i like this threefold training or <laughs> there's sila samadhi panya obviously but dana sila bhavana is also really beautiful because so much of our lives, of our daily life, in the Dhamma will be around dana, And that means give of your smile, give of your metta. 
we, we do these retreats, we develop these beautiful states, and just, it's to be kind. <laughs> It's to, be, it's to be compassionate, it's to be helpful with somebody. It's also, it's also the purpose of what we're doing. I mean, there's not really any point in practicing loving kindness if you're gonna be like not loving and kind in your daily life. So it's a direct application. And when you do this, remember, this is your dana practice. This is what you're giving. This is your gift to the world. And it's the most, the highest, the, the best gift that you can give is this steady presence of mind, the seven supports of awakening that you have cultivated within you. The smile. You're a happy person. You're a pleasant person to be around. It's just fun to be around you. It's just light. You know, there's no, there's no problems. There's no tension. There's no... Yeah, it's like something arises, even it's like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever, you know? And then, and then life becomes so light, it becomes so easy. And then you will see that when people see somebody like that, they want to be like that. <laughs> when you see someone that's happy, that's successful, and that's just beaming happiness, like, we all want to be like that. That's all we want to be. That's, we want to be successful. We want to be happy. We want to be loving and kind and loved and be able to love also. And so naturally, people, that's the, that's the natural attraction of, of wisdom, of panya, is that it just shines. It's just attractive. It's beautiful. Everybody wants it. When you see somebody like that, you want to be like that. And so when somebody sees you really happy, really smiling, and like not, not having so much problems in life, you know, you just, yeah, everything's good. Like the, yeah, of course, there's things that arise once in a while, and then, yeah, but you can six R it, and then you can just keep going and enjoy the metta with a smile. Majakara, chaliga, no problem. And so, remember this, even though you're, you're practicing bhavana, wholesome mental states, developing those within you, you, don't, you, you, we never keep mental states for ourselves. When we have anger, we give anger. It's, we don't keep it for ourselves. We never keep it for ourselves. When we have impatience, we give impatience. That's what we give to the world. That's our gift, our legacy. But when we cultivate the seven supports of awakening, when we cultivate metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, the clear mind, the satipatthanas, the six R's, right effort, this is such an amazing gift for the world and everybody around you. And you will notice that actually this is also helping you in return because the people will be interested, they will start to be kind. They will start smiling back at you. They will start doing nice things to you. <laughs> and they will start wondering, so where did you go for 10 days? <laughs> and then you can all have a good time next retreat. <laughs> so in little more technical terms, what can we do at home now? with the practice, how does it work, and where, where should you start, how should you practice, because as you've seen, this meditation is quite dynamic, right? There's many things happening, many things that can go this way or that way, so now, where do we go, what do we do? And well, first, I just want to say, virtue is your protection, and this will maintain, basically, that is really the first uh, step of the four wise efforts, basically, the four right efforts, is, is part of it. And that's to protect yourself, your mind, your heart from unwholesome states from arising. And the virtue is what does that. Virtue will make the boundaries where, okay, this is the limit. <laughs> you know, beyond this, I'm not going, not killing not stealing, not telling lies, 
not uh, doing any uh, sexual misbehavior, not drinking, because that's going to make sure that I have a clear mind and all of this can stay together as a whole. Now, when you uphold your virtue very well, your practice will be very well supported. It has the causes and conditions to be supported. So then after that, you can start building on top of that. And like Venerable Metananda shared with us on the discourse, the Samadhi Sutta, the five points on this, this particular Samadhi that we're practicing, this, this kind of Samadhi, which is not one-pointed, because it's definitely saying it, that doesn't come from forcing or pushing or pulling, uh, it is very sensitive to virtue. So uh, if you were to really focus your mind on something, virtue is it's, it's helpful, but it's not that relevant. When we develop wholesome states like we've been doing, the metta and the joy, the smiling, and then the mind gets collected by that, it's a very different kind of meditation. And if we're going to break the virtues a lot, it's going to be nearly impossible to meditate like this. So this meditation is very virtue sensitive. <laughs> so keep that in mind. So that's why it is very important to uphold. So after you do this, <clears throat> now where do we start in meditation? Well, you start pretty much where you were, what you were doing. And I, I, I will repeat uh, the, the whole sequence, so just that to make sure everybody goes home with the right understanding. Everybody is at different places, so <clears throat> we've all, everybody has taken their own route at some point during the retreat, and I just want to wrap up in a straight line so that we can remember how, how this practice works. And so, basically, if you were with the spiritual friend, <clears throat> you can start with the spiritual friend. If the spiritual friend for you is, uh, is easy to bring up loving kindness, just do that, just do that. And if uh, that was where uh, you stayed most of the retreat and well, until this point, then continue with that, that's good. If you need to go back and send love to yourself and then send, send love to your, uh, spiritual friend, your Kalyana Mitra, that's okay, no problem, all good, Sadhike. And then, if you were told uh, instructions on breaking down the barriers and um, uh, radiating to the directions, then you start with that. That's your meditation now. So you start five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, and then all, all at once, okay? Not pushing, not forcing, just allowing it to shine. That's it, with a smile. <laughs> and of course, the six R's remain the same throughout, whether you start with yourself, whether you're a spiritual friend, whether you're with the directions. Now, some of you, are at this place where it's metta in all directions okay and at that point the metta has gone to the head so at some point it will go to the head again that's normal now you know it's normal and if you've gone deeper if you were radiating uh, some kind of lighter joy or lighter calm or equanimity and it was radiant calm your object of meditation then you as you bring up the metta to the six directions and then you feel it um, whenever it goes up and then radiating to all directions, you simply allow it to calm down as you six are. So this is a natural process. It's, it's pretty much happening on its own. You don't, you don't really have to force this. It might take 10 minutes, it might take it might take an hour and a half, it might take even two hours. It, it, the time frame doesn't really matter. The, what matters is that you know that this is the path. And the reason why we keep 
telling people start with the meta, even if it's going to be for a little while, and if you, even if you can access the quiet mind even at some point very quickly, always start with the metta. That will make sure that you start with the right foundation for this practice. So it will clear the slate of your mind and sometimes when people have gone beyond radiant equanimity or radiant calm into the quiet mind where the mind is just very still, very bliss, blissful and quiet. Sometimes we, if we don't start with the metta, the mind tries to latch at this experience. It tries, tries to jump at it and kind of catch it because it, it's used to, it knows that state. It kind of can remember it. But the trick is you're not doing it properly. So you're going to lose it. And then you're going to wonder like, what's going on? What's wrong with my practice? Well, it's because you're not starting with the metta again, with the joy, the smiling, the six R's, and then it goes up. And then that's very easy. Good. So starting from the metta and then let it naturally evolve as it goes. Don't try to make it something. It'll just go there on its own as you six R. Huh? So Man bata classic sar kara. Okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I was listening. I, I, I was learning also this retreat. Good. And then you will see, okay, so it doesn't really matter when it, where it's going to land. Or, and if it stops at a spe specific station, that's okay. That's okay. Just stay there. Enjoy. Maja kara. And then... And then if it goes to quiet mind, then great, stay in quiet mind. If it doesn't go to quiet mind, that's okay, no problem. So after that, uh, the amount of time that you're going to sit is also uh, good to look into. Uh, we usually, I mean, if, if you ask me how long you should sit, that's a, probably a bad idea. But because uh, I'm going to say seven to eight hours every day. But <laughs> I don't think you have that much time. <laughs> I think that's the sweet spot. Seven hours is really good. But um, I understand that everybody has that kind of time. So um, generally we say, well, of course, as much as you can. But two hours every day is really good for keeping the practice going. And. Uh, a lot of us are familiar with one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening, but if your practice has been such that you have been sitting for two hour sits here, it's better to have one two hour sit than two one hour sits. Because your mind will have enough time to go deep enough to experience some of the deeper stages and that will be more beneficial for you and you will feel like it's more beneficial you your mind will delight more in that than two smaller sits of course if you were all already doing one hour sits that's okay you can do one hour in the morning one hour in the evening and that's fine that no, no problem you can do whatever you want usually two hours will be a good amount of time to really maintain and to basically to keep and maintain what you've acquired here, what you've uh, gained here, and that will maintain it. And then for those of you who've practiced forgiveness uh, during this retreat or up until now, remember that forgiveness is probably one of the most useful tools you can have, especially in your daily life. <laughs> it's like a uh, it's like an emerg emergency button uh, 6R kind of thing. It's a, it's a big, it's a big 6R uh, tool, basically, which you can, use, you can use all the time, basically. You can find all the reasons in the world to forgive, and that will really help you let go and not accumulate all the stuff that people can bring to you. And you can just go like, ah, OK. <laughs> It's okay, I forgive you. It's okay, I forgive you for not understanding. I forgive you for, you know, just doing, doing what you're doing. Not, not being very helpful and hurting me or whatever it is, whatever it happens to be. 
and you'll see your, your life will become much more fluid, much more pleasant also. Not, not crisping, not, you know, like taking it in, taking it personal, just like, okay, you're suffering too. Like, I forgive you. Like, having compassion, this is karuna also. Forgiveness is karuna. So, for those of you who have spent some time on forgiveness on this retreat, this is an amazing tool to bring home with you. So, just so you know. I think, for me, it's been one of the most useful, to be honest. Like, uh, yeah. So, you can use it all the time for a lot of different situations. Good, good. All living beings want to be happy. Just remember that. Yes, our teacher, Bhante Vimalaramsi, would say, don't be a Buddhist, be the Buddha. <laughs> and when we go home, sometimes uh, family members or friends might not really understand what this is all about that you've been doing here or the Buddhist faith. But when they see you embodying the teaching of the Buddha, they are more likely to get curious and ask you about it. Or, uh, at the very least, like what they've been saying, they'll want to be around you and they'll just really appreciate uh, what you've been doing there. Uh, you can always remember you're one six hour away from a mini nirvana. No matter how long you've been distracted, you're always just a six hour away from freedom. So what you might find, what I think you will find is that, you know, there's times during the day where you're just completely in the flow of whatever you're doing and that might be necessary for your work. And then there's this moment where you wake up and you go, whoa, where have I been? <laughs> and now you're here again. And that's a, that's a beautiful moment. You should rejoice in that because that's the new habit that you're building. To keep coming back again and again. And so I think this wraps up the technical part of <clears throat> how to meditate at home, bringing home this practice. Now we've been spending 10 days and you know it's so many things happen and we have the daily interviews to make sure that everybody stays on track and now this is the template so this is what you want to be using and um, the sut I just want to end this retreat on, uh, I mean, I I'll say a few end things at the end, but um, uh, picking out from the jewel box here, uh, again, my community in Canada would roll their eyes, but uh, by me saying that it's one of my favorite suttas, but, <laughs> but it is, <laughs> and that's why I put it in the book. <laughs> um, this is like a, a, this is kind of like my little jewel box. Uh, of suttas that I wanted to commit to memory. I'm not done. Uh, I'm, I'm working on it. It's going to take me a, a while. But um, the, on page 123, 123, Ek Do Tin. Jar Nau Das. Yeah. <laughs> complicated <laughs> and so um, this is such a little jewel in the suttas uh, this is uh, the Chakkawati Sihanada uh, did I Sihanada yes um, it's, a, it's a long discourse but this is just an extract of it really going to, to the core, to the best. And it's such a really good sutta to keep in mind in your life and how do, what we practice, what, how we should see that, how we should see everything that we're doing here, uh, how we should uh, develop our understanding. And I'll read the English because it's... Uh, it's... Uh, my translation is offering a bit of a different understanding, I think. And then we have the Pali after with Dr. Yojana. So I think that'll be a good combination. Okay. So stay in your own fields, monks. Stay on. Oh, no, no, no. 
I, I'll just I'll just read it. Basically, yeah, I know it's in the reciting book, but it's because it's quite lengthy. If we're gonna recite it all, I was thinking um, I'm just basically gonna read it like if I were to uh, explain it. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna go through it, and then I w I was expecting or uh, thinking that Dr. Yojana would explain the Marathi with the Pali and like you've, you've been doing? Yes. Okay, 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 good. Stay in your own fields, monks. Stay on familiar grounds. Abiding in your own fields, abiding on familiar grounds. You will grow in vitality, you will grow in beauty, you will grow in happiness, and you will grow in wealth, you will grow in power. And what, monks, is vitality for monks and nuns? Here, monks, the mental collectedness obtained by way of desire and willful striving, one develops that road of power. The mental collectedness obtained by way of determination and willful striving, one develops this road to power. The mental collectedness obtained by way of mind and willful striving, one develops this road to power. The mental collectedness obtained by way of exploration and willful striving, one develops this road to power. Of course, in English and in Pali, the syntax is completely reversed. So here I've adapted my translations to fit like word for word the Pali, but yeah, so it turns out a little strange in English. <laughs> um, one in whom these four roads to power are developed and continually practiced may resolve to live for an eon or for the remainder of an eon. This is vitality for monks and nuns. Basically, what this means is like, of course, this is the Iddipadas, uh, the road to psychic powers or psychic abilities. But this is also uh, a way that we have to strengthen our practice. Basically, it's that it's it is part of the effort, the wiriya. Basically, when you look at the um, the formula for wiriya, this is also where you find chanda, because um, wiriya has this aspect of yes, um, protecting from unwholesome states, uh, abandoning unwholesome states cultivating wholesome ones and then maintaining wholesome states but it's not just that it's doing this continuously but desiring to continuously do this without stopping it's a uh, I can't remember the Pali but <laughs> the word Chanda is in there and um, Chandang, Chandang Janati Viryam Arabati Guiriang Arabati Chittang Paganhati Padahati. Oh, wow, I remember. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so it's not only uh, doing these four different steps of protecting, letting go, arising, and then maintaining, it's also doing that constantly, putting our minds to it with chanda, with desire, and that's wholesome desire. And a lot of people say, you know, you have, you can't want anything in Buddhism. Like it's like, you can't, like desire is, is evil, but it's not true. There's chanda, and that is wholesome desire. And one, uh, one thing that happens is uh, when we cultivate these things, um, basically, uh, desire for the Dhamma, desire for the practice, with determination, applying our whole mind to it, and exploring the Dhamma, then a lot of knowledge comes up. And this is how we, um, we also can, uh, basically, we, we grow in vitality because when we practice this Dhamma, we let go of so much tension. And this is uh, also helping us uh, with vitality. This is helping us uh, with energy and also uh, letting go of unwholesome states. When we let go of craving, it's amazing the amount of energy, mental energy that we gain 
because we realize how much our mind was actually um, yes attached but it takes a lot of energy to latch on and to cling to a lot to everything and when when this is getting looser we notice like wow <laughs> this is like I have so much more energy like things are so much easier because I'm not always like this I'm not always tensed at another level we can like make determinations like I'm gonna like live like the Dalai Lama he says he's gonna live till a hundred and twenty or something I can't remember yeah he said I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna die at a hundred and something 18 or something yeah it's like no I just take the determination <laughs> <laughs> and that's a bit how that works like the Buddha said that he if somebody asked him he could live for the remainder of an eon right um, and then Ananda didn't think of asking him to stay <laughs> it's like he was kind of uh, bashed by the Sangha but <laughs> So there, the, the other interpretation of that is that like a, an eon could also mean a hundred years, like a full human life lifespan. Yeah, because the Buddha passed at 80 or close to that. And he said, I could live up to, to the remain, for the remainder of an eon, but I don't think that meant an actual eon, a kappa. So, okay. So that was the longest and... Uh, I think the rest will go a little faster. <clears throat> and what monks is beauty for monks and nuns? Beauty. Here monks, a monk or nun is virtuous, living by the self-mastery of the Patimukkha, endowed with skillful behavior, seeing danger in the slightest fault, undertaking the practice of the training rules. This monk is beauty for monks and nuns. And of course, when I say for monks and nuns, it's, it's, it's just because he's talking to monks and nuns, but it's for everybody. When, when you're virtuous, you're shining, you're, you're beautiful. It's, it's the, it, just, it just happens, you know, it, it just, um, it's something that, that happens through your own actions. Your own actions become beautiful, they become bright and attractive they attract people also they attract uh, they attract goodness and I just really love that the Buddha is you know get offering us this perspective that our virtue is actually the beauty here because of course monks and nuns we can't you know we can't have uh, fancy clothes and all this and you know we have uh, rag robes and uh, well not 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 often but uh, we only have this and uh, but our beauty is is our virtue and this is the same for you and what monks is happiness for monks and nuns this is interesting here monks letting go of sensory engagement letting go of unwholesome mental states assisted by thinking and imagining with the blissful happiness born of letting go one understands and abides in the first level of meditation. As thinking and imagining calm down with inner tranquilization, the mind becoming unified without thinking and imagination, with joy and happiness born of mental collectedness, one understands and dwells in the second level of meditation. As excited joy calms down, meditating with steady awareness, present and fully comprehending, experiencing happiness within one's body, a state which the awakened ones describe steady presence of mind. This is a pleasant abiding. One understands and abides in the third level of meditation. Unattached to pleasant sensations and unstirred by unpleasant ones, as mental excitement and heaviness settle, one's mind is balanced purified by unmoving presence one understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation this monks is happiness for monks and nuns and so this is more and more the well at which you will come to drink to find your happiness 
not in the world, not in the things that can just be taken away from you. That's not a wise investment of your happiness. And more and more you'll see. And you can just sit there on a cushion. It doesn't cost you anything. You just have to close your eyes and sit down for a couple of hours and just bliss out and be happy for two hours, non-stop, freebies, just joy, 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 coming out, pouring out of every pores of your being. And then that didn't cost you anything. And it just required that you sit down for a little bit. And when you know this mental development, this training, you're the richest person in the world. And what monks is wealth for monks and nuns? So you can't handle money. How can you be wealthy? Here, monks, one meditates with a mind filled with love, with a mind filled with compassion, with a mind filled with joy, with a mind filled with calm, pervading one direction, likewise a second, likewise a third, likewise a fourth. So above, below, and around, to all directions, to all living beings in this boundless universe, one meditates with a mind filled with calm, vast, expansive, and unbounded, radiant, without a trace of anger or impatience. This, monks, is wealth for a monk. So when you're in these four states, you're in a Brahma Loka. <laughs> That's as simple as this. And how could you be more happy? How could you have more? I mean, this is it. This is what everybody's looking for. Love, compassion, joy, calm. These are the four states that Brahma was known to be living in. The four Brahma Viharas. So, when you live in these states, you can't be more wealthy. That's, that's all. Everybody that has like all the wealth, the money in the world, in the end, that's what they want. <laughs> that's what they're after. But we, we get it from the source. So, we're pretty lucky here. So, we're the wealthiest persons. And what monks is strength for a monk? for monks and nuns. Here, monks, with the complete stilling of mental agitation, one is distractionless, without batakla. <coughs> unbinded mind, unbinded by discernment, knowing it here and now by direct experience, one lives and remains in it. This, monks, is strength for a monk or nun. So, the state of the mind which you've attained through using the six R's and letting go of the asavas, letting go, relaxing, calming down, bringing up the wholesome states, this is also your strength. And when you go back home, you will notice. <laughs> Monks, I do not see a single power, a single other power so hard to overcome as the power of Mara. The accumulation of wholesome states, monks, is the cause for merit to grow. Thus spoke the Awakened One. Uplifted, the monks delighted and rejoiced in the Awakened One's speech. And so here the Buddha ends by saying, just do good deeds. Don't stop. <laughs> And you will get to Nibbana. You will overcome Mara and its troops. And you will be very happy. Looping back to the beginning, stay in your own fields, stay on familiar grounds. The Buddha actually in that sutta says, these are the four Satipatthanas. So stay there, stay there. Six are the rest. Stay with the Brahma Viharas. Stay with the Satipatthanas. Don't, don't judge, don't create opinions, don't create tension outside of this. And all of this will grow, you will see. And then you will overcome and keep doing this. Don't stop.
do good deeds. One last thing is uh, I like to remind us that uh, all of this has been made possible by uh, our utmost Kalyanamitta, the Buddha. And uh, he himself said that it is because of wise friendship, virtuous friendship, Kalyanamitta, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, that we can get all of this. And this is the whole of the path. Wise friendship is the whole of the path. And you, you're probably familiar with the sutta where Ananda comes to the Buddha and says, Bhante Bhagavan, this must be, this, surely this must be at least half of the holy life. He's a wise, wise company, wise friendship, Kalyanamitatta. The Buddha said, don't say that, Ananda. It's the whole of the spiritual life. Because it is because of wise friends, wise friendship that we can get all of this by our wise association coming to a retreat like this. The people you choose to spend time with in your life and for you especially it's the Pali department. <laughs> because uh, that, and that's quite a wonderful uh, opportunity. It's quite a wonderful, um, wonderful circumstances because you are all like a big family here and uh, you've chosen to be there and that's wonderful and uh, you're all Kalyanamittas basically you're all a family here <clears throat> but to remember that Kalyanamittatta is what brings you also the Dhamma the knowledge and so to be wise about the, per the people you surround yourself with to be wise um, also the Buddha said that you should always seek for someone uh, to associate with people that are uh, more advanced than you on the path so that you can learn and make a lot of progress. And so, uh, and without the Buddha, well, all of this wouldn't be possible. So he's the first example. And uh, a few notes, I guess, uh, before we, we, we wrap up this retreat. Um, maybe more on the technical side. Um, I know we, we had a lot of questions about uh, contacting or contact information and things like that. So I guess, um, how do I, shall I say that? Well, a lot of the information, all the suttas that I've been reading, of course, they're mainly in Pali and, and Marathi, but my own translations are all on a website called Heart Dhamma, heartdhamma.love. And uh, just to make sure, <laughs> yes, so yes, so yes, it's here. Very good. I forgot it was there. <laughs> it's also in the one of the first page, and it's on the bookmark. So this is where all the news from our community, Hard Dhamma, which also uh, you know, there's many people all around. Uh, Hard Dhamma is simply something that I, uh, a foundation or an organization that I founded in Canada when I was there. And uh, it basically acts as a container for all of my work and uh, news from our community and retreats, uh, sutta translations and books. So uh, there's the YouTube channel also with the same name, Hard Dhamma, where all the talks, all the retreats are there. Um, this, I think, will be the first real uh, full retreat with Marathi. Yes, yes, that's great. That's, that's wonderful. So I think that's going to be a good, uh, good thing for all the Marathi-speaking people. Good. Huh. I write a newsletter bi-weekly every couple of weeks to everybody in the community say what's going on, what are the next retreats happening. There's a new sutta translation every, every two weeks and a new uh, a teaching basically uh, proposed and sometimes uh, Venerable helps me with creative ideas because <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. He knows a lot more than me. And um, yeah, retreat opportunities, uh, pictures and all that. It's all there. So you, if you are getting the newsletter, then you will, you will at least get 
you know, uh, most of the things that you, you want to get. And then there's a, a link to join the Signal group on there. Uh, there's links for all of our everything <laughs> on, on that newsletter. Upcoming retreats. Hmm. Dr. Yojana and I will have to talk. But <laughs> uh, I'm planning to maybe, well, of course, uh, Venerable and I are going to Sri Lanka, bringing uh, Metananda to my forest monastery in Sri Lanka. I'm gonna spend some time there. Hopefully tour around some holy places. Uh, I'm gonna be staying there for three weeks. He's gonna be staying there for a few months. We're preparing him, gearing him up so that he doesn't lack of anything in the, in the jungle. He's gonna go to my kuti in the jungle. And then um, I'm going to the US in California for a retreat on Easter. It's been a, a long classic in the Dhammasukha tradition. But it's been going for 18 years, I think. This year is the 18th year. Uh, there's rumors about Australia as well, but that's a bit far. Yeah, there's lots of rumors going on. So, <laughs> um, I just want to say that it was a pleasure to have you all on retreat and um, a real pleasure to see everybody start smiling more and more and uh, majakara more and more and become the beautiful bright beings that you are right now. And not that you were not before, but now you're especially bright. Yes, I usually end the retreat with, okay. Oh, yes, 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 sorry. I'm just on a roll. <laughs> yes, yes, he's going to elephant land. My kuti has elephants all over the place. Yes, yes. One came near my car Oh, yes, 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 yes. So I like to end every retreat by asking everyone, everybody here for your forgiveness. So please forgive me if I have said or done anything that could have come across as hurtful or uh, inappropriate. It was definitely not meant, but these things happen. And um, please forgive me. And I wish I only have uh, all the love for everybody here. I hope everything goes well for you in the future. And I hope we get to see each other again. So, <laughs> very good. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you, Dr. Yojana, and the entire Poly Department. Uh, all of you brightened my day. Every time I saw your faces getting uh, brighter, brighter, younger, and younger. And uh, that's really for me seeing people's progress on this retreat. Even if you don't realize it as much when you're in it, because things go up and down, but then looking back at the end of the retreat and just seeing these really smiley, uh, beautiful faces. It's, it's just a treat, and then obviously just everything that you've been doing for us the past 10 days, from our little alms round routine, which is just such a wonderful uh, occasion with, with everyone there offering the food. I've never been a part of that before, and it's been very humbling for me. <clears throat> and I'm very grateful for all the people who have been coming and helping our cookies and just all the little, the little things, juice. Uh, so we've been so well taken care of here. I feel uh, great, very grateful for you all. And then uh, special thanks to Bhante Nanda for taking me under his wing. Uh, <laughs> still being able to fly both both wings. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm still learning, so I apologize if I've uh, offended anybody. Um, uh, please forgive me as well, and uh, so we can all forgive each other. <laughs> and yes, uh, very grateful to be a part of this. I, I think uh, I just want to make a special thanks 
to Dr. Yojana. Dr. Yojana Tai. Yes. I mean, uh, I know what it uh, takes to uh, organize a retreat and to, uh, I mean, I can't even imagine running a department. <laughs> but uh, it's so beautiful to see. And uh, uh, what, what, a, what a beautiful group of people and so many merits. Uh, 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 yes, yes. So many merits. This is what ha happened. So many smiles now. Happy department. Yes, yes, yes. So much love and care from, from her for, for everybody. So I think uh, it's, it's quite wonderful to see. So I think you're, everybody is in, the, in good hands. <laughs> Very good. And I like to, um, I like to uh, end the retreat on uh, short 10 15 minute metta meditation okay relaxing your whole body relaxing relaxing letting go of everything that has been talked about letting go of any currents in your mind, allowing the river of your experience to just wash through, to flow through. Simply relax, relax, and smile. Looking back now that the 10 day retreat is coming to a close, feeling so much gratitude, so much happiness for everything that happened during these past 10 days. Even challenges turning into gold even hard times being transformed into joy and letting go. Just perhaps even repeating Thank you, thank you, thank you. Dhanyawad, dhanyawad, dhanyawad. Having had such precious opportunity and going home with such wealth, joy, and happiness, calm. Slowly, you can tune in, drop down into the feeling of metta, 
ignite the feeling of metta. Feeling coursing through your whole body, suffusing your whole body. And noticing as you relax more and more into this pure metta. oozing out of every pores of your skin, going beyond your body and shining outwards. touching everything. Going through <laughs> everything. The walls, the trees, the sky, the earth. Feeling so much love for all living beings. Knowing that all living beings just want to be happy, just want to be loved. Take part in this 
May all living beings feel this love that I feel, this happiness. Perhaps for a few moments you can come down from the heavens and come down from this beautiful Brahma Loka and think of your whole family. and given them your love. All the love that you have unearthed on this retreat. your friends To everybody that you know in your life that surrounds you. And now, to everybody at the Poly Department, to that whole building and all the people in it, May all of them be happy, be loved, be well, be successful.
to everybody that served on this retreat, all the people that supported this retreat, who made it happen, the Sonawane family, everybody. from far or near. to Venerable Metananda, setting all of your love. <clears throat> For it is kind and loving presence on this retreat, assisting and helping everyone. May he be well, may he be happy, may he be healthy and protected. And now to Dr. Yojana. May she be happy, may she be well, may she be protected, healthy. May she live long and enjoy a good life. And finally, to my dearly beloved teacher, Pante Vimala Ramsi, who brought us this amazing teaching. May he be well. May he be happy. May he be healthy.
May you all be well and happy, healthy. May you all have a good life. And slowly coming back to your senses, welcoming the room. Slowly opening up your eyes. Getting ready for group picture. <laughs>